today I'm going to show you how I built this 12 volt portable battery. It's a 100 amp hour lithium battery pack and I use it to charge our electric bikes, to charge our travel trailer battery, and to run a small inverter for things like an electric blanket, and also show you how we charge it using uh, our solar panel. This is one of my electric bikes. It runs on 44 volts and it uses two 6S RC LiPo batteries. This is the battery charger that I use. It can charge and balance lithium batteries or charge lead acid batteries. It's basically a buck boost converter. You can input a wide range of DC voltages and it can output a wide range of DC voltages out. So I'm just powering this battery charger with my portable lithium battery. On the top of the battery box you can see through the window there's a couple battery management boards there. I'll talk about those in a few minutes. And I'm just using a rope handle since it's low profile when it's retracted. Since I have two batteries in the bike, I charge them in parallel. And this was one of the first TIG welding projects I did was this white battery box on my bike. I'm using a 30 watt solar panel, which gets us five amp hours a day of charging in full sun. And that's enough to recoup what we use throughout the night running the heater. I built an MPPT charge controller with some parts on Amazon. Right now it's early morning in February, so I'm only pulling about 20 watts, but in the summer we get the full 30 watts if the panel's rated. I made the charge controller for about $20 worth of parts. I really like how small and compact it is. It can fit in a drawer in our trailer. And since it's not particularly high current, I can use these DC barrel jack extension cords that are 18 gauge to place the panel where it needs to be to get full sunlight. And as I said before, we use the battery to charge our travel trailer. In the summer, when we don't use the heater much, we only use about 5 amp hours a day. In the cold winter time, we might use 10 or 15. So with this 100 amp hour battery, plus the battery in the trailer, we should have enough power for at least two weeks. A lead acid battery can only charge so quickly, so it's nice to let this charge for an hour, rather than having a generator running for an hour every day. And we have a small inverter that we can run inside the trailer. Uh, so this battery can run that as well. When we're driving, I can charge my portable battery off the alternator from the car. And this charger is bi-directional, so I can also charge the car's battery off of this portable battery. I installed a 90 amp feed directly to the car's battery. One goes to the trunk and the other goes under the hood. And I also made a set of jumper leads, so for a car that I don't drive very often, I can top off the battery without having to run an extension cord out. The cells I'm using are 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate cells. I installed this Link Pro battery meter that displays voltage, current, and amp hours consumed, so it's basically a fuel gauge for the battery. On the top of each of the four cells is a cell balancer board. If a cell's at too high a state of charge, it will dump power into a resistor to allow the other cells to catch up so that the pack is balanced. It also measures the voltage to make sure that it's within a safe range of 2.5 to 3.6 volts. If the voltage is outside of that range, there's a series circuit that each board can open and tell the battery management system to disconnect the pack and sound an alarm buzzer. The green light indicates that the cell voltage is normal and the red light indicates that it is shunting power to balance. I have two plugs. The one on the bottom is unprotected and it turns on with the on switch. And the upper one turns on with the BMS after pressing the reset button. The BMS can turn that output off, disconnecting it from the charger or load if a cell voltage is outside of the normal range. And here's a quick size comparison with our portable generator. Obviously the battery is going to be completely silent. And the battery weighs in at 44 pounds. So now I'm going to show you how I built the box. I buy these scrap pieces of plastic from Tap Plastics. They're usually a dollar to two dollars a piece depending on the size. And I'm just using double sided tape to stick it down onto my CNC router. The router uses a program called Carbide Create and that's what I use to draw what I want the CNC to machine out. 
Hey, when I turn the machine on, first you have to home it to tell it where the edge of the material is. You always locate the bottom left corner. And I usually slip a piece of paper under the bit to set the Z height. And you can see here it's doing all the hard work for me. It's really nice to have something so precise making these cuts. And it's a lot safer than trying to use a table saw for this task. That was the main reason I bought the CNC router. Once it's done, pop it off and usually have to deburr the edges a little bit to knock down any sharp edges left behind. And here I'm just doing a trial fit to make sure all the joints fit. And uh, it's really re rewarding having everything fit so precisely. It's worth the extra time it takes to do it on a CNC. The gray pieces are straight from the scrap bin, and I'm going to cut them down on a table saw to match the width of the battery. And it's just faster to use a table saw than running everything on the CNC. Here I'm machining the top window plate that goes over the top of the batteries. And cuts like this you can only really do on a CNC because I have a, a recessed pocket to hold the, the clear window. And I'm machining the front and rear covers. And here I'm just checking to make sure all the pieces fit together and it's really nice having everything fit so precisely. My plan was to use a strap for a handle and I also wanted some finger grips to carry the batteries. I'm installing a 30 amp fuse just to protect the wiring and try and do a clean job of routing wires. The white wire connecting to each BMS board is the healthy signal. This is a pilot guided drill bit used for drilling centered holes. Just a standard drill bit. This is an upcut tap which sends all the chip loads up out of the hole and this is a counter sink. The drill guide has a 6mm diameter which matches the holes that I machined with the CNC and the holes come out dead center. And once I have all the pilot holes drilled, it's just quick work to drill the right hole for the tap, run the tap, and as you can see, this spiral cut tap does a good job of evacuating the chips from the hole. And just running a deburr tool, and it's really nice having lots of drills so you don't have to keep changing bits in the chuck. Makes for a really efficient workflow. And you can see I've got most of the battery box put together. Here I'm machining the last of the pieces. This is the front panel where all the switches and the battery meter will mount. There's also a bottom cover that I'm cutting out and I'll separate the two on the table saw because I need to cut with a beveled cut. I try not to cut all the way through the material so I don't cut through my waste board. So I usually leave a real thin piece of material that I can cut with a deburr tool. When soldering these XT90 connectors, I always put the mating connector on the other end to act as a heat sink. The connectors are plastic and it's real easy to melt them. And I make sure to wet both sides, the wire and the connector. Just enough solder on the soldering iron tip to make good thermal contact. And then you want to add solder to the part that you're soldering so that it wicks in and wets out nicely. When both sides are wetted, when you finally melt everything together, you'll know that there's no voids in between, and you'll have a good strong contact. I didn't have any of the crimp connectors for these small connectors, so I just soldered and went over them with heat shrink to protect the wires. These big crimp fittings can be a little tricky to crimp. Make sure you find a, a good quality crimper that crimps the entire width of the terminal. I like this one because it does a compound crimp. And this is another type of crimp connector. Definitely helps to have the right tools for doing this. And it does take a little bit of practice to get it right. One set of crimps is for crimping the conductor and the other set is for strain relief for the cable insulation. And these terminals are for the relay socket that hold the relay. There are four connections to the battery, the positive and negative leads, and then the two wires for the healthy loop from the BMS boards. 
on the control panel we have the BMS motherboard at the bottom and this is where the cell boards connect the loop connects to those two pins right there and just above it is a buzzer that'll sound if a cell is unhealthy and this is a shunt that's used by the battery meter to measure current I'm using a mechanical relay instead of a solid state relay because I need the power to flow both directions for stranded wire I like using ferrules it keeps the strands of wire constrained Without them, thermal expansion and vibration can cause the strands to relax around the screw that's clamping them and cause a loose connection. And when using ferrules, you want to make sure the wire goes all the way to the end so that the ferrule's not carrying the current. I really like using these Wego wire nets. They're a spring cage clamp design. They're rated 32 amps. And it's really nice to be able to see the wires going all the way to the end. And there's always a spring tension holding the connection tight so you don't have to worry about screws coming loose. Whenever I'm working on a mechanical design, I try and think about wire management and how the wires will be run. It works out much cleaner that way if you design it in from the start rather than an afterthought. And here I'm just measuring the voltage of each cell to see how well balanced they are. It looks like these are all within 10 millivolts of each other, which is really good. I have the battery all wired up, and I can display on the meter uh, voltage, time remaining, percent charge, amp hours, and amps. And it shows here I'm charging with about 16 amps, and my battery charger fits on the top perfectly, and I can charge from AC or DC sources. This is the first discharge test I did. I discharged to 75 amp hours just to see where the baseline capacity is. And after the test, the battery was still at 12.2 volts, so they're still in pretty good shape considering they're 10 years old. This charger can run off of 110 to 240 volts AC or a wide range of DC volts from a battery. I built this battery with parts I had laying around left over from my electric car project. So I probably spent less than $40 to put it all together. If you were buying all the parts brand new, you'd be looking at about $600 or more. But considering how many usable amp hours you get from a small lightweight portable battery and the cycle life improvements of lithium versus lead acid, it's actually a pretty good value.